Good afternoon. My name is Victoria Freer, and I am a correctional health specialist with the American Correctional Association's Office of Correctional Health. We want to thank you for attending today's special critical issues webinar on the coronavirus. We hope this session will give you and your agencies understanding of the preventative measures against the impact of coronavirus for your correctional staff, correctional population, visitors, and the community at large. We want to acknowledge the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention for all their hard work and dedication in keeping the world informed, safe, healthy, and instructing us every step of the way in this public health crisis. In addition, we want to acknowledge ACA's executive leadership, Mr. Gary Moore, the 106th president of the American Correctional Association, and executive director of ACA, Jim Gondals. Dr. Betty Gondals and the Office of Correctional Health staff for the support and work on making this webinar possible. More importantly, we want to thank the correctional professors today. They are correctional and public health leaders in the field. This webinar could not be possible without their dedication. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. The audio is being broadcast on your computer speakers today due to limited space for people calling in. If you would like to use your phone instead, please dial 1-650-479-3207. The access code is 661-009-866. Your phone lines are muted, so we will not be able to hear you throughout the entire webinar. We do have time designated at the end of the presentation and ask that you type your questions into the Q&A box on your screen. Please only use the Q&A box for your questions. Questions asked in the chat box may not be seen by facilitators. We ask that you hold your questions until we get closer to the end of the presentation because they may be answered throughout the presentation. This webinar is sponsored by the Coalition of Correctional Health Authorities, chaired by Harbin Steele, Medical Director of Health Services and Health Authority for Nebraska Department of Correctional Services. Part of the Coalition of Correctional Health Authorities' mission is to address critical health issues that impact correction staff, correctional populations, and to identify exemplary practices to address the critical issue we face in corrections. Because of the possible impact that the coronavirus could have on corrections, we hope this webinar will bring you the last information on the coronavirus, which will be beneficial to the field. Our moderator for today's event is Dr. Jerome Greenfield, Health Services Administrator and Health Authority for the Iowa Department of Corrections and Vice Chair of the CCHA Clinical Practice Updates Working Group. After graduating from Drake University and the University of Iowa College of Medicine, he completed a residency in psychiatry at Kansas University Medical Center. Dr. Greenfield is board certified through the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and is a distinguished fellow. He oversees the medical, psychiatric, and dental care of Iowa's 8,300 offenders. Dr. Greenfield is also the current president of the Iowa Psychiatric Society. We are pleased to have Dr. Greenfield moderating today's session. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I am uh, honored to be here today. We have a very impressive panel to discuss this current crisis. Dr. Harbenz Deal earned his PhD in immunology and microbiology from New York University and his DO from Des Moines University, followed by a residency in internal medicine at Norwalk Hospital, an affiliate of Yale University. He has been medical director for the past 20 years, overseeing the medical, mental health, dental, and pharmaceutical departments. Dr. Dill has conducted research in hepatitis C and HIV using molecular biology techniques as a research scientist in a pharmaceutical company. He has numerous patents and publications in the scientific arena. Dr. Deal 
was appointed medical director in January 2017 for the Nebraska Department of Correctional Services. He oversees the Health Services Division, which includes medical, dental, psychiatry, and behavior health. He serves as the health authority for Nebraska and is the current chair of CCHA. Dr. Philip Kaiser's primary interest has been in the care and treatment of HIV and its related infections. He's been actively treating HIV-infected individuals for over 30 years. He's the director of the Ryan White Clinic in Galveston and the lead physician for the Regional AIDS Education and Training Center. He has significant experience in HIV care, treatment, and clinical research in the Sub-Saharan Africa. He was medical technical advisor for PEPFAR, the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, and helped establish HIV clinics throughout East Africa. He's involved in the Global Health Program and regularly takes students and residents to Kenya. He is the director of the UTMB Antibiotic Stewardship Program. This program seeks to optimize the use of antibiotic across the health system and utilizes both implementation research and outcome research techniques. Dr. Kaiser is also the local health authority for Galveston County and has been active in preparing the COVID-19 response for that region and for the state. Ms. Michelle Vietz is a registered nurse with greater than 20 years experience working for the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction in the healthcare field. She has held positions as a line staff nurse, healthcare administrator, regional nurse administrator, director of nursing, clinical placement, and acuity administrator, and clinical healthcare specialist. Michelle Vietz graduated from Fairview Hospital's registered nursing program in June of 1996. She is the chair of the American Correctional Association's Healthcare Committee and sits on ACA's Correctional Nurses Committee. Major Jimmy Barrett has been employed with the Arlington County Sheriff's Office, Virginia, since 1992 and has been Director of Corrections since 2015. As a Director of Corrections, he has facilitated the Sheriff's Office through two successful American Correctional Association and PREA accreditations. Major Barrett has won numerous awards, including a Valor Award from Arlington Chamber of Commerce, a Life-Saving Award, President's Award from the Court Officers and Deputies Association, Meritorious Service Awards, and Outstanding Young Deputy Sheriff from Arlington County JCs. Major Barrett holds a Master's Degree in Public Administration from George Mason University and a Bachelor's Degree in Political Science from Texas Lutheran University. Michael Resnick. Mr. Resnick has spent over 25 years working in law, criminal justice, and public safety. A lawyer, Mr. Resnick began his career defending police officers, sheriff deputies, and correctional officers in civil rights litigation. He served as Chief Legal Counsel and Chief of Staff of the Philadelphia Prison System, Director of Public Safety of the City of Philadelphia, and Acting Commissioner of the Philadelphia Prison System. Currently, he serves as Commissioner of the Division of Pretrial Detention and Services Overseeing the Baltimore City Jails. Annette Chambers-Smith. Director Chambers-Smith began to career with the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation Correction in 1993, working in the Records Office and Secretary of Positions. She went on to hold numerous positions, including Inspector of Institutional Services, Assistant Chief Inspector, Deputy Warden, Warden, and Chief of Bureau of Medical Services. In addition to her role as Chief, Director Chamber Smith was also the Warden of Corrections Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. Governor Mike DeWine appointed her as the very first female director of the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction in January 2019. During her time as director, she has implemented significant reforms to help the agency meet its critical mission of reducing recidivism and keeping Ohio communities safe. She's established agency core values to take care of our staff. They will transform our offenders. One team, one purpose, civility towards all, and hope is job one. Director Chamber Smith was a National Merit Scholar and attended Wilberforce University where she graduated summa cum laude. She's received numerous awards throughout her career. In 2010, she received a mark of distinction from the American Correctional Association when she was named the best in business. More recently, Director Chamber Smith received Director Moore's Impact Award in 2011 and twice in 2014. In 2019, she was inducted as a lifetime member of the National Association of, of Blacks in Criminal Justice. She currently serves as a member of ACA Standards Committee and was previously served as a member of ACA's Coalition for Correctional Healthcare Authorities when she was Ohio's Correctional Health Authority. Our objectives for today one, discuss the current evolution of novel coronavirus COVID-19 and its immune determinants. Number two, to understand the epidemiology, infection control, prevention, recommendations unique to correctional systems. Three, to recognize clinical symptoms within correctional facilities and implementations of appropriate infection prevention control measures. 
And lastly, the panelists have no disclosures for this webinar. We will begin with Dr. Deal. Gary? Thanks, Jerry. So we'll be discussing the epidemiology and the historical perspective of the coronavirus. The coronavirus uh, is an interesting virus that it derives its name from the epitopes that are projected on the surface. Um, electron microscopy picture shows that the numerous projections, what we refer to as viral spike papillomeres that you see on the picture on the right-hand side, the green projections coming out of the virus. Uh, on the surface, they look like crown, hence the name coronavirus, derived from Latin corona, meaning crown or halo. Coronavirus were recently identified, uh, most recently as the 1960s. It is a zoonotic virus that can infect humans and animals. Almost everyone gets infected at least once in their lifetime, especially in, in one's childhood. Antibodies that are formed are humoral in nature, that's suggesting that the Im immunity may be limited. We have heard of zoonotic viruses uh, before, and they've been abound in certain regions of the world. I'm sure you recall the Ebola virus that was prevalent in Africa last year and the year before. We've heard about the bird flu, we have heard about swine flu, and also HIV that was heard uh, and been treated fairly well uh, these days, uh, just to name a few. However, it's important to remember influenza is, a, is not to be confused with zoonotic virus. It's a human disease that we are so familiar, familiar with. We take vaccinations for prevention, as well as we use our, our universal precautions for prevention of the influenza. So the next slide shows these as coronavirus, as mentioned, being a zoonotic transmission. That is, it's a spillover from, from animals to humans. Now, there were seven uh, coronaviruses that have been identified since the 1960s. Some of them have a potential to cause severe, severe infections, but the rest of them tend to cause mild or moderate infections. The four that are listed up there, 229E and NL63, OC43, and HKU1, really tend to cause very mild infection. Uh, if there might be some moderate infections causing some uh, fever and cough. Signs and symptoms of these are similar to head cold that we are all familiar with. We probably all had the sign cold, uh, head cold, which, is, which suggests that it is very difficult to separate the rhinovirus that we uh, which is a benign uh, common cold virus that can cause congestion and fullness, fullness like symptoms. Most of us do not seek medical attention and but when infected as it is a self-limiting disease. Coronavirus, the ones, the three we talked about, uh, the four we talked about were mild, but our, the, the other three that are, we have heard about in the past two decades are much more severe. And we've heard those viruses can cause severe symptoms, especially in immunocompromised hosts and maybe life-threatening. Two of these we might have heard in the past, and I'll kind of go over this in a, in a, in a little bit to talk about uh, the mortality rate, which sometimes causes some panic. Uh, you may have heard of these over the past two decades. One of them is called severe acute respiratory syndrome transmitted from civet cats. And we have uh, used the acronym as SARS-CoV. The other one is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, abbreviation as MERS-CoV, transmitted from drum dirty camels. Both of these can cause severe pneumonia and potentially be life-threatening. Now, SARS-CoV was identified in 2002, started out in China, and MERS-CoV was identified in 2012, which has started out in our Middle East regions. The third potential one that we are discussing is today. It is called COVID-19. Uh, if you remember, in early 2020, after December 2019 outbreak in Wuhan, China, we started to learn about potential transmission of humans, of a virus that belonged to coronavirus species. As mentioned earlier, it is a zoonotic transmission. World Health Organization identified a new type of 2019 novel coronavirus, which can be fatal. Later, it was named as COVID-19. Now, studies are ongoing to understand the mechanism of transmission. The transmission risk at that is still an incomplete. Epidemiological studies in Hubei province, China, identified as an initial association with seafood and live animal markets. Spillover from animal to human occurred, and as a result, we now have seen human-to-human -human transmission. This is confirmed in China, as well as a hundred other countries, including USA. 
WHO Health Organization yesterday suggested that we may be nearing a more of a pandemic spread. Uh, it was had declared emergency in January. So what are coronaviruses? Coronaviruses are a large group of viruses. It is common in many species of animals, especially uh, the examples that we give with dogs, cats, uh, chickens, uh, camels, and, and bats. Signs and symptoms are interesting because they vary differently. Chickens seems to, when infected with coronavirus, have upper respiratory type of infections. And when we see the infections in cows and pigs, they tend to cause diarrhea. The reason of this is really important because we need to identify and distinguish between upper respiratory infections that we tend to see in human diseases versus that they are transmitted from animals. So as we go through the slides, we'll talk about a little bit more. So coronavirus has sub multiple subspecies and they are designated as alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. It belongs to a sub, to subfamily of coronaviridae that belongs to the order of nidoviralis. This is how viruses are classified. Coronaviruses, however, are single, uh, are enveloped virus with single-stranded RNA genome. In studying this new coronavirus, especially using the full genomic sequencing as well as phylogenetic analysis, indicate that COVID-19 belongs to beta coronaviruses. Now, this is a, a subgenus of SARS, but in a different clade, which suggests that they might be sharing a common ancestry, but at least distantly related. So one of the epidemiologic studies indicated that uh, when we look at the receptor binding study, they have much more similar to SARS and MERS, but are diff distantly related. So there is a dis little bit of a clue suggesting that this possibly might share the common source of uh, uh, animal to, to humans. RNA sequence is similar to both of the previous ones we uh, indicated, and both of the previous ones, SARS and MERS, which was, um, inf uh, came for severe cats and camels, were both were originally originated you know, from bats. So now the studies that indicate COVID-19 may be similar, but it has not been verified at this time. Let's look at the uh, clinical features because that's what's more concerning to us as we have to deal with in a correctional environment and how do we prepare for uh, addressing the viruses spreading into our system. So the incubation period is believed to be 2 to 14 days. Uh, some studies had actually suggested it might go to 23 days, and I think that might be a little misnomer because further analysis of the study showed that the average onset of symptoms is approximately 5 days. So following exposure. So most likely the incubation period is anywhere from 2 to 14 days following an exposure. In a family cluster of infections, now this is a little bit different in a sense that the onset can occur between three to days, three to six days, and I believe this is related to the, the dosage of the viruses that somebody might be ex exposed to. Now, most common feature of this disease is pneumonia. It's very prevalent that it develops into alveolar sac, causing some uh, fluid buildup and or pus, preceded by shortness of breath. And I think this is really important for us to recognize because what happens is that when we try to distinguish between common cold and short uh, influenza virus, we don't see shortness of breath as much uh, causing symptoms. So this is a unique feature of the coronavirus. And the studies have shown that actually shortness of breath or hunger for air develops around 11.5 days. As of this uh, date, the mortality rate is uh, uh, approximately 3%. Let me remind you, and that's the mortality rate uh, for SARS, which was discovered in 2002, is approximately 11%. So we are really nowhere near the mortality rate that we have seen with SARS in 2002. And to give you a perspective of something similar to that in 2012, which was MERS, the mortality rate was about 37%. So let me kind of close by giving an overview of uh, our the overview of COVID-19. We know it was identified first in Wuhan, China, and especially it was linked to seafood and live animal markets. Now it, it has, the transmission has occurred as a spillover to humans, and we know now that the human-to-human -human transmission is confirmed, especially in immunocompromised patients. We also recognize this was imported to U.S., and initial studies, as initial data that we had looked at was coming, travelers coming from uh, other countries but now we have human-to-human -human transmissions uh, in, in, the, in the U.S. And there have been more than 500 cases that have been identified, and as, the, as you have seen some of the pictures probably on TV, the cruise ships and air travel uh, per, taking some precautions. 
multiple cases of people-to-people -people transmission between household contacts have occurred, and it's been reported, especially in immunocompromised patients as well as um, uh, in elderly population. So you will tend to see more and more mortality rate as, as, as the ages in this specific group. So symptoms include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. So this is kind of a takeoff message for us to make sure we do ask for questions when we screen people for shortness of breath in initial stages or in the mid stages of the infection. Infection can occur within two days of exposure or as long as 14 days. A multiple city uh, airport screen travelers and quarantine if it's indicated. Now the situation is very fluid and the landscape is changing rapidly. Uh, so we try to keep track of the cases every day, uh, certainly to inform our staff and educate our staff on the basis that we learned from today's webinar. So at this point, I'm going to turn over to the next speaker for public health collaborations and uh, kind of remind you all that really prevention is the key. Dr. Kaiser? Yes, hi. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Philip Kaiser, and I'm, I guess I'm talking to you on my role as the local health authority for Galveston County. I can tell you that in our uh, 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 jurisdiction, we've been very concerned about coronavirus and have been doing planning. Since about mid-January, we've fielded scores of calls. We've tested lots and lots of patients. Um, I'm very happy to say we have no active cases yet, but we do have active cases in Houston, which is only 40 miles away, and up in Dallas, which is about 300 miles away from us, but still in the state of Texas, we, there's actually local spread of the uh, virus. So this is, I think, uh, something that's very concerning. So when you talk about a public health approach to um, this virus or any type of virus, we use certain factors to try and determine whether people have or may have the infection we're concerned with. And so with uh, coronavirus, with COVID-19, um, we have really been looking at very traditional epidemiologic uh, criteria. And so if you go to the first slide, um, what you will see is a picture of China with Wuhan very highly um, lighted up. And initially we were told if someone is from Wuhan and they have certain uh, uh, symptoms that you should be very careful and be concerned that they have a coronavirus. But unfortunately, as we have seen the spread of coronavirus around the world, and certainly the rapidity of spread, um, those epidemiologic factors are no longer helpful. So it's simply not enough to say, oh, they didn't come from China, they didn't come from Italy, they weren't on a cruise ship in, uh, in Egypt, they weren't on one of the cruise ships that, that were affected. Those things, while they may increase our risk, it doesn't reassure us that they don't have it. So our current epidemiologic risk is anyone with known or suspected contact with someone infected with coronavirus. So today, what that means is that someone who has been to Northern California, someone who's been to the Seattle area, um, perhaps someone who's been in Dallas. Um, and we expect that uh, this is going to be changing in communities across the entire United States. And so, unfortunately, we, as we have lost that place holder that tells us that someone is at greater risk, um, and that means that we need to be more vigilant about what uh, we're seeing in front of us. If you go down to the next slide, you will see a slide, a, a graph of uh, what happened in Wuhan, China, among the first of 425 confirmed cases of coronavirus. And what you can see is that the coronavirus actually comes out in, in several waves. So if you look at the very first part of that graph, you'll see isolated cases, a case here a few days later, another case, few days later, another case. And then you move into the section where you have multiple cases uh, occurring. And so um, you can see like maybe two, three cases a day. And then finally, the case number starts to go up, and then you have a generalized uh, epidemic as they had in Wuhan. In most places in the United States today, we're either in that pre uh, epidemic phase where there are no cases or where there are isolated cases. However, as you can see, that's what happened in Italy and Seattle and in San Francisco area, that is, can change very, very rapidly. So what that means is that we have to be very vigilant and uh, paying attention to the numbers of cases in our areas and also in areas around us 
to get a sense of how close are we to start seeing cases. Where well, we are now in, uh, in southeast Texas, we're expecting to see uh, cases in, in our community probably within the next week or two. And so I think it's definitely coming. Um, if you go to the next slide, what you see is a very graphic description of how coronavirus is transmitted. It is transmitted through what we call droplets. And if you can see this young woman sneezing, what you're really seeing are little bits of snot and spit. Okay? And the reason why it's called droplets is because these are, these are tiny balls that are formed when people sneeze. It goes out about four or five feet, and then it drops to the ground. So that is very important because it gives us two things. One is that it's not aerosol, meaning that it's not floating around in the room after someone sneezes. It falls to the ground. So you don't have to worry about uh, someone who, you know, may be sitting a certain distance away from and just breathing the same air. It's not like tuberculosis in that sense. Uh, and so you really have to have the, 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 uh, the droplets on you. The other way that it then gets trans, so the first way you can get infected is if somebody coughs in your face. That's an important one, particularly for healthcare workers, because that, that uh, goes to the types of protection that uh, one needs. Um, but also, it can then fall on surfaces. It can fall on tables. It can fall on chairs. Sometimes people will wipe their nose. It gets on hands. And then when that happens, we go shake hands with somebody. We give somebody a hug. Um, and then our nose itches a little bit. We rub our nose. And when we rub our nose, then we, uh, we infect ourselves. And so um, the droplets have both some good and bad aspects to it. One, it's not aerosolized, but two, those droplets can be in many, many places. Uh, many people are asking, how long does this virus live on surfaces? And the answer is we don't know for this particular virus. For other coronaviruses, it can be as short as four hours. In others, it can be as long as five or six days. That leads to, again, important considerations in terms of environment and making sure you have clean environments. Um, since we don't have good epidemiology, we have to rely on symptoms. And the symptoms of coronavirus, the cardinal symptoms are fever and cough. Okay, and I'm going to say that again. The cardinal symptoms are fever and cough. Typically, people do not have upper respiratory tract symptoms. They can, those are minor symptoms, but it occurs in about 5% of the people that have uh, coronavirus infection. Uh, in a recent interview on NPR, the director of the University of Washington, the coronavirus testing lab, uh, said that of the people that were positive, they had fever and cough without upper respiratory symptoms, and most of the upper respiratory symptoms were in the people that were negative. And again, upper respiratory symptoms don't rule it out, but it's fever and cough that we're really after. Early on in the, uh, in the infection, individuals can have diarrhea, they can have nausea, but that typically uh, goes away. So um, if we turn to the next slide, what you see is a graphic description of the first U.S. case of COVID-19. It was a man who was uh, in Seattle. And if you look at the different bars, what you can see is that uh, these are the symptoms that uh, he had and at, at what points that he had them. And, what, and you see that the number one symptom he had was cough. And then he developed a fever. And when he gave interviews to people, he said, you know, I just had a little cough. It, it just didn't seem bad at all. Uh, and it just didn't go away, and every day it got a little worse, and every day it got a little worse. And then by about five days later, I started feeling bad. And that's when I figured something was up. You also noticed that he had some diarrhea, and he had some vomiting um, early on in the, in the course. Now, one of the, the, while the primary mode of transmission is through droplets, there may also be fecal oral spread. So if people have diarrhea and bad diarrhea, 
um, then that can be spread around and then other people can accidentally pick it up and ingest it and then get uh, um, uh, the infection. In some ways, to me, this, this may explain why it's so rampant in uh, some of the cruise ships that have been infected. Not only do you have the droplets, but we also know that diarrheal illnesses in cruise ships, and particularly in these confined areas, can spread very, very rapidly. So just having that little bit of uh, coronavirus diarrhea may help uh, um, promote the spread in a confined area. So this gentleman actually did very well. He, uh, he, he was sick for about two weeks, and, and then he got better, and everything was fine. And we're going to get into some of the risk factors for people having bad outcomes and who we need to worry about. How long is the incubation period? It's been listed as about 2 to 12 days. It has an average of five days. A new study just out of China, wherever the data was just reanalyzed, said it's about four to eight days in most cases. And most exposures, that is people who have been exposed but don't get infected, after 14 days, nothing happens to them. They're, they're clear. One of the things that we have to look at is who is the most risk of getting, dis not just getting disease, but who is the most risk of having a bad outcome and what is the course of this illness because that's going to be very important in terms of who we prioritize. 80% um, of the people have self-limited disease. They do just fine. They have cough. They have fever. They last for about two weeks. They get better. Up to 20% of individuals may have severe disease that requires hospitalization. And by that, in those individuals, we see not only fever and cough, we also see hypoxia, a decreased PO2, and uh, you can see uh, findings on chest X-ray and or CT scan. About 5 to 10 percent of them require mechanical uh, ventilation. And the latest uh, information out of Italy is that uh, the time on a ventilator is almost about 20 days. And so this is why they're having such a problem, because they're seeing uh, more and more cases every day, and they're not able to get people off the ventilator once they're on the ventilator, and so they're not freeing up ventilators for, for new cases, and they're getting to a point where, where they're very concerned that they may run out of ventilators. And then about 2 to 3 percent of the patients die. And the question is, who dies? And so if we go to the next slide, what you can see is the uh, COVID death rate by age. Uh, there's some good news here as well as some bad news here. The good news is that children do not seem to be affected badly at all. Children under age 10, there's been not a single death. Uh, once you get over age 10, it's about a death rate of about 0.2% up through your fifth decade. Uh, that is up until the time that you're 50. When someone reaches the age of 50, then the uh, death rate is 1.3%, 63 points. Uh, 6%, 70% takes a big jump, 8%, and over 80%, 14%. So those individuals that are most at risk for having bad outcomes are the elderly. Now, that doesn't mean that it's okay for kids to get it, because kids can be a vector. A child could go to school, be sick, be feeling, you know, a little under the weather, but otherwise okay, and then go visit grandma and grandpa. And infect them, and then the, uh, the, the grandparents may get severely ill or may die. In addition, there are other risks uh, that have been uh, demonstrated, such as cancer, lung disease, heart disease, diabetes. People ask me, what is the contribution of diabetes? Is it bad diabetes or mild diabetes? Is it mild heart disease or bad heart disease? How, how important is it that someone have heart disease versus age? The answer is we don't know the answers to those questions. The types of analysis that would need to be done to address those questions have not yet been completed, and so we simply don't know. But if you had an older patient who's healthy, that's better than an older patient with hypertension and diabetes and cardiovascular disease. However, there have been healthy 70-year-olds who have gone into the hospital and who have died. Okay, so what do we have to control this virus? And the bottom line is all we have are isolation and quarantine, i.e. distancing people so that they don't spread. We don't have a vaccine. We do not have effective therapies that are available for us at this point. So 
The first thing is to look at it, look at uh, potential infections from an individual point of view. What do we do with the individual case that we're concerned about? And then what about from larger population points of view? How do we handle those? So the first control measure is if you think you have a case, put a mask on them. Very first thing. I don't have an N95 mask. It doesn't have to be an N95 mask. Put anything on them, anything so that when they cough, that those droplets are not spreading around. The next thing is put them in some sort of isolation. A negative pressure room is best, but if you don't have one, it doesn't matter. Don't wait around for a negative pressure room. Separate that patient from the rest of the patient population. Put them in a broom closet if you have to. Just put them somewhere where they can be by themselves and they're not likely to cough on other people. The next thing is to do an evaluation. And this is a very, very important thing. And, and one of the things that, that we saw early on when we started getting calls about coronavirus was, oh, I think I have a coronavirus patient. Well, what have you done with them? Well, I, 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 put, I put a mask on them and I put them in a room. Okay, fine. Has anybody examined them? No. Has anybody done any tests on them? No. Okay, so it's not enough just to put them in a room. We have to do our due diligence as healthcare workers and then go through the next steps. So that means the healthcare workers need to have PPE. And, uh, and basically, we're using droplet precautions. Now, if you can go to the CDC website, where they have um, a lot of uh, uh, you know, good descriptions of droplet precautions, um, and uh, there are also a lot of videos out there on how to put things on and take things off, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, but the uh, healthcare workers need to use PPE, and that includes eye protection, a mask, preferably an N95 mask, a gown, and gloves. And then go see that patient. The N95 mask is best because it keeps in case someone gets coughed on in the face, and you know, as healthcare workers, a lot of times we can't avoid that. Having the, the N95 keeps those particles from going into our nose and mouth, and having the goggles or some sort of eyewear uh, prevents that from getting into the eyes. With that, we would also then suggest doing a full assessment. Right now, we're getting a lot of flu tests because it's not circulating in our community yet. We know it will be, but we're able to rule out a lot of people if we get a lot of flu tests. We're also doing the molecular diagnostics to look for other viruses to see if we can find an alternative explanation for it. Um, but uh, if we can't find an alternative explanation for it, then we do testing and uh, probably take a little bit of time at the end to talk about um, uh, uh, doing testing. Um, so once that person has had their, uh, you know, it has the drop of precautions, they come out, they see the patient, they've done, they've listened to them, they've, they've, uh, they've taken what other tests that they need to do, um, then it comes time to take off the gear. And this is an important thing. One of the biggest mistakes we see is people taking their gloves off, reaching to the mask with their hands, taking the mask off with their hands by touching the front of the mask. And when they do that, then they contaminate their hands again, okay? So it should be a very stereotypic way of taking it off. Take it off gloves, take the mask off behind the ears, take the gown off, wash the hands thoroughly before you scratch your nose because your nose was itchy because you were wearing a mask for a half hour or an hour, okay? This is very, very important. There are multiple videos out there. CDC has them at their website. Um, uh, my university, UTMB, um, has it on their website. And I think there's, very, there, there's a good way to train people. It's very important that you start training your staff in proper use of uh, droplet precautions at uh, um, this time. And then, once you have identified that patient, your healthcare workers have seen him, it's important to get a sense of who is that person around and then to quarantine them, get them away from uh, other people and put them in a place where they won't be able to, um, uh, to infect anyone else. Now, within prison systems, this obviously creates problems, right? Because most of the, at least in Texas, what we have is we have a lot of very, uh, you know, open formats. Um, there's not a lot of isolation rooms, um, but uh, as much as possible, one is going to have to look at social distancing, of uh, getting the people away 
from the other folks and, and somewhere else. That may mean looking at a particular dorm and using that as your, your isolation and your quarantine dorm. Um, and if you have an outbreak within your particular unit, it may mean just locking down that unit and nobody goes in and out um, in terms of uh, the offenders. Um, with the, as we broaden out toward other places, we need to be concerned about social distancing. And so um, I, it, it's important that uh, if there is an outbreak, we don't want it to spread among the rest of the workforce. This is very, very important because one of the things that can happen is that as the workforce gets sick, then suddenly you have a reduction in your workforce and you, and you may find that it, it's hard to do your mission critical work. So, um, so as much as possible is, uh, is to have people, if the, when an outbreak occurs, is to have people work at home. Um, and then also uh, isolate or quarantine potentially exposed employees. So what does that mean? That means right now, you know, with, uh, without having widespread spread around the United States, that means employees that have, you know, gone on vacation and they've gone to a place where there's it's high risk, uh, what we're doing is we're asking them to, to stay home and work at home if possible. Um, it can potentially create some administrative issues, um, and, but uh, we're finding our employers are being very uh, creative in finding work for people to do that they can do at home. Uh, and, and not to actually come in and expose, uh, you know, people, either patients or prisoners or what have you. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, is that, and so much as possible, if you are going to do that to employees, try and find ways to give them some sort of administrative leave. Why? Well, because if, if employees are concerned that, well, if I don't go into work today, I'm not going to get paid. If I call in sick, I'm going to lose my sick time. I don't have any sick time left, or I'm going to lose vacation time. If that's a word for them, they're going to come in sick, and they're not going to tell you they're sick. And we don't want them at work. And so it's very, very important to let everybody know, no sick people at work, and not, oh, I'm only a little sick. It's like, you have a respiratory tract infection, you stay home. And that's very, very important in protecting not only the rest of your staff, but also uh, the, the offenders. The other thing is to either screen heavily your visitors or even say no visitors. And again, that's something that we have not, uh, you know, in, in our county, we're not, we're not telling people, you know, you can't have visitors and people can't travel. But if we start having widespread disease, we will say that. For, for vulnerable populations that, you know, you, there will be no visitors. Some of the hospitals in our region are already starting to do it. Another thing to do is to consider limiting transfers to other units within a, a prison system. That, that's a way that things can be transmitted very, very quickly. And so um, I realize a lot of this stuff, people are thinking, oh, my God, how are you going to do that? All honesty, I don't know. I'm just trying to lay out some principles, and every site is going to have to figure out their own way to, to try and ameliorate the effects. Lastly, I wanted to say a few words about testing, is that tests are available, but, it, uh, but they may be hard to get. Um, last week we were told that any American who wanted a test could get one. Well, it turned out that wasn't true. Not enough tests were out there. This week we're told that there were about 4 million tests out there. Um, and uh, so what I would urge everyone to do is to look in your local area, find out who's doing testing, and develop a, uh, a pathway to get those tests done. Uh, getting testing done can be extremely helpful. If you have a case or a potential case, it will allow you to clear that case very, very much more quickly than putting them in quarantine for uh, 14 days. Um, if there's a, a low risk to it. Um, the other thing, it will also help you pick up the people who are less symptomatic and then isolate them from other folks and, and help spread as well. But getting tests on a, on a, uh, in a rapid fashion is very important, and I would, again, I would encourage you all to, to look at your, in your local jurisdictions, find out who's doing the testing, and uh, make some arrangements. Both Quest and LabCorp are now accepting tests. Um, it, they say that it takes about four days to get the test back, but we'll have to wait and see. So with that, I think we'll just really just kind of uh, look at the last slide and, and, and really kind of get what we want to get at, which is we want to identify cases, we want to isolate uh, suspected cases. You need to educate your staff and also uh, the offenders because what we found is that people understand what you're doing. They're extremely cooperative. Uh, we have had very few people even challenge what we've asked them to do. We've 
no one reviews. So uh, educating defenders, I think, is very uh, important. And then we stop transmission of the virus as best as we can. So with that, I'll stop. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kaiser. So that leads us into developing our model system for within the correction system. If I can have the next slide there. Victoria, can I have the next slide? There you go. Thanks, Victoria. So then you just heard about the epidemiology and the course of events, clinical course of events uh, that uh, coronavirus presents to us. So what are the challenges that we develop? So we have kind of talked about a model system that we can present to the correctional system to say how do we address coronavirus or outbreak in DOC. So your job during the outbreak is to help identify cases, treat or provide security for infected individuals and prevent the spread of virus within DOC facilities. So what we developed is a five different systems. One, one is to identify cases, and I'll walk you through each bullet point there. And number two is isolate suspected cases as the previous speakers talked about, educate your staff, which is really important, and including the inmates, and of course stop the transmission of viruses. And finally, once you have all that stuff, we still need to continue to do the surveillance of new ones. So let me go back to the how do you identify cases. So there are two different clinical criteria that we look at. One is clinically and one is epidemiological criteria. As we just heard about, heard about the fever and cough is the symptoms that clinically we can decide uh, without having a lower tract infections. But it's also to keep in mind not only you have fever, cough, but difficulty breathing. That's a clinical symptom that we address. And the epidemiological criteria is really just what we talked about earlier is any contact with an individual who's infected with or suspected to be infected with the coronavirus. And the testing is going to be very important to de determine how long we are uh, quarantine somebody else. The second step is really to look at isolated suspected cases. So anyone with symptoms of coronavirus must be separated in an isolated cell. It doesn't necessarily have to be a negative pressure cell, I just was mentioned earlier. If you do have available, that's actually a bonus. Number two, you can also look at standard airborne precautions with directions shall be posted for anyone entering the inmate cell. That should be very important so we protect both the, the people who are providing the care and where, as well as the inmate. So standard precautions also should be used by all staff when entering the patient's cell, caring for the patient, and when transferring the patient. We're, all, we're also aware of uh, PPE equipment, including respiratory protection when entering the patient's cell. The patient may, must also wear a surgical mask when moving within or outside the facility. And you also have to alert the medical provider to a, a suspected case once you have the suspecting coronavirus. The other po bullet point to remember is pregnant women, pregnant medical staff or pregnant security staff should not be assigned to a module or work in an area where there's an infection, uh, infected patient is housed. And the other critical point to remember is an inmate with confirmed coronavirus should remain in isolation until cleared by a medical practitioner. So the third model system that you can develop is especially for educating your staff and inmates is to place educational flyers throughout the facility alerting inmates and staff to report any coronavirus type symptoms. I think education is going to be very important for all of, all of our staff and, and the people that we take care of. Also distribute educational material about the signs and symptoms of coronavirus. You know, you just heard some of the symptoms we talked about, especially the fever and cough that will last for a while uh, to medical staff as well as security staff. And also in your facilities, make sure you instruct your medical and security staff on the isolation procedures for the facility and posting of uh, modified droplet precautions. Not only the droplet or the aerosol is both important because we have to wipe the surfaces off with the droplets that the people might come in contact with. The next step that you want to think about is stop transmission of virus. Right, movement of infant uh, inmates to and from facility with a confirmed case of virus should be should be minimized. I think it, the, the less you move the uh, inmates, the better off you are. Move, movement in and out of the module, which houses an infected inmate, should be minimized. And any room that's occupied by an infected individual should be thoroughly cleaned. This is going to be very important, especially as we talked about the, the transmission mode of either aerosolized or droplets that fall into the floor or the any surface. So this includes uh, cleaning and dis disinfection of all surfaces. I mean, I would probably suggest in your facilities right now, you be sure to start taking precautions at this point. Now, wash hands with soap and water after providing patient care and making really in, uh, inmate contact uh, or handling items used by an infected person. 
And last of all is don't forget the surveillance of new cases because no matter what happens, remember we get people from county jails and everywhere else, and since it takes about 14 days after a case of a crime has been confirmed to determine whether the infection has spread to others. So it's prudent for us to kind of keep looking for the new cases. Uh, inmates and staff are also, uh, should also be uh, immediately report suspicions of any new coronavirus to the medical staff so appropriate steps can be taken, especially doing the testing as soon as possible and so we can quarantine or isolate people from other areas. So I'll turn over to the next speaker there. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Deal. Uh, Michelle Vietz, uh, you're up next. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to talk about screening procedures for patients coming in the door. So not only are we going to speak about prison patients, but we're also going to speak about jail patients as well. So we need to talk about what that looks like for people that um, are coming in to, for both clinical criteria and epi epidemiological risks. So we have had great coverage so far in reference to both of those areas, but we're going to touch on that insofar as what we need to look at for screening patients coming into both areas. So for intakes and transfers for both jails and prisons, we need to create screening assessments for both of those areas. We need to look at the clinical criteria, meaning we need to start screening for patients that have fevers and for patients with the lower respiratory symptoms and illnesses, meaning the cough, the pneumonia-type symptoms, difficulty breathing. Also, we need to look at the epidemiologic risks. So those patients that perhaps have had contact, close contact with patients with confirmed COVID, a confirmed patient with a COVID-19 disease, also someone that has had recent history of travel to one of the geographical regions. As we know, and I'm, I'm sure everyone has kept up on this, the areas are rapidly changing, so we need to keep up on those areas and they are rapidly expanding and changing. So if we give those areas now, it's not going to be valid tomorrow or even later today. So we need to keep up on where those regions are. Um, additionally, um, if we have someone coming in the door that has an unexplained fever or severe respiratory symptoms, we need to screen those patients as well and ensure that we are hitting all the um, respiratory symptoms and look at perhaps isolating those patients as well. To continue with the screening procedure, we're going to move that patient to a single cell if they hit any of the epidemiological risks. We need to screen them twice a day for up to 14 days, and we need to let a medical provider know that we have someone that meets those risk factors. Should we have someone that meets the clinical portion, meaning they come in and they have a fever greater than 100.4, or they have some lower respiratory symptoms, they're coughing, um, and they have those, again, whether it's travel, they have been in contact someone, with someone that has been diagnosed, those per persons need to be immediately placed into a single cell and your medical provider needs contacted immediately. I would also make sure that that person has a mask put on them. Um, the other folks inside your facility are made aware that you have someone that we um, are suspecting that we have someone that has some clinical risk factors here. The next few slides are really fantastic, and I think that the greater um, field will be very appreciative of this. And this will kind of spell out to you um, how do you know and what are your, how do you identify your risk levels? When are you at greatest risk and when is someone um, not quite as, um, you know, you're, it's not going to raise the hair on the back of your neck as you're assessing them coming in the door? So we know if someone comes in and they have their fever, they have um, been in contact with someone that has been diagnosed most recently, those folks obviously are your highest risk folks. They immediately need to be placed in isolation. Your providers need to be made aware, and those are the people that need to be seen immediately. If you have folks that have 
one or more of the symptoms um, or meet those criteria, those folks still need to be taken seriously. We still need to take measures to continue to assess them. We, we still need to put them in isolation. You still need to take precautions with those patients um, and work them through the entire process. Let your provider know that you have someone that meets one or more of the symptoms, whether it's your fevers, your lower respiratory symptoms, but perhaps they have not been in contact with someone. Um, perhaps it is just the flu, but that we need to walk through those steps to find out what is going on with that particular person. Um, but you're, you are able then to screen folks out as well to say, you know, we have X number of people coming in the door. There are no risk factors for these particular people and they have been in no contact with anyone that has had any other risk factors so they would be cleared. So it makes a nice um, little system for you to be able to use for your facility. The next page that we're on now shows some risk assessments. Um, this is a nice little guide again that will give you some um, criteria to show when to quarantine folks and when there is no risk to your population and to your, your staff. It's very important to know that if you have someone that does come in and they are exhibiting any signs and symptoms and they are coughing to take some immediate measures to make sure that those droplets are not contaminating other folks. It, and even if you have folks that are at the lower risk level, that social distancing is very important. We need to make sure that we're housing people in single cells if that is available at your facility. We need to make every attempt to make that happen. So when are people most contagious? And this is a question that has come up quite a bit. So the thought is at this time that people are most contagious when they're most sick. So when they have the highest fever, when they're coughing the most, when they're feeling fatigued, um, when they're suddenly worsening and feeling the, the pneumonia type symptoms. However, it has also been said that folks are still contagious when they're not feeling any of those symptoms at all. So just be wary of that and know that that is still a possibility. So if you have folks that are exhibiting those symptoms, make sure that you are providing those masks for, for folks and that you are keeping them distanced away from anybody else in your facilities. Prevention. So we do know that there is currently no vaccine available for COVID-19. The best route for prevention is to not be exposed, which means keep your social distancing, make sure that you're washing your hands often, whether you're, it's not just at times that you're using the restroom, but constantly washing your hands, making things available such as your hand sanitizer, Stay home and encourage folks to stay home when they're sick. Encourage good cough and sneeze etiquette, using tissues when possible, throwing them in the trash. The, have a cleaning schedule available at your facility and strongly encouraging that so that people are going around and cleaning those surfaces where if someone does sneeze or cough and the droplets land on a countertop or a table, that that is being washed down and those throwaway towels are put into the trash. So those are all very important preventive measures to ensure that we're not contaminating one another. The hand washing, again, at least 20 seconds before you eat, after blowing your nose and sneezing, coughing, You've, again, you don't have to make sure that your hands are dirty. If you just constantly wash your hands with soap and water, if soap is not available, soap and water, we, we encourage 60% alcohol-based hand sanitizer. This would be the time it's feasible in your facilities to have hand sanitizer available in some capacity for your staff and your patients if able. We understand if you can't, but 
let's make sure that if you can, that um, you're able to, to do that. Make sure that there is plenty of soap available in all areas and that folks are rounding through to ensure that there is soap for patients and for your staff. When to use a mask. So we know that our folks that are coming in, our patients that are sneezing and coughing, we need to make sure that they have a mask placed on them immediately. We don't want them spreading the droplets around. If you need to wear a mask, if you start coughing or sneezing, healthy folks, however, should not be putting masks on. That is not encouraged at this time. Masks are only effective when you're washing your hands and um, when your hands are clean and healthcare folks should wear them when they're seeing the sick patient. And you should also, again, as I know it was discussed a little earlier, to know how to properly take off a mask. It doesn't do any good to grab the front of a, a mask that's been coughed on with your hands and then dispose of it because then you're contaminating um, your hands and then it kind of defeats the purpose. So there are plenty of um, videos out there to discuss how to remove masks appropriately, how to remove gloves. So make sure that you're sharing that information with the folks that, whether it's the patient so that they understand how to take off the masks and your staff if they need to wear them, healthcare staff as well. And this is more of the same information. We're strongly encouraging proper hand washing techniques at least 20 seconds or longer in conjunction with a face mask. And they should, the face mask should only be used for folks that are coughing and sneezing. And if you're healthy, we're not encouraging the use of the face masks at this time. How to prepare. So the screening, of course, we want to make sure that all staff, not staff, I'm sorry, the patients are, are screened when they're coming in. There are some places that are screening staff, which we're completely on board with, but have a plan. That's most important to plan now if, in case you do have that case that comes into your facility. Have your isolation area depicted. If you need to send a patient to the hospital, how are you going to do that? If, how are you going to handle your officers during transport? Um, the hospitals are encouraging staff, our healthcare staff, to call ahead so that they understand what they're receiving. They don't want folks to just come in the door with a suspected case and not have that advanced knowledge so that they can prepare. So make sure that those phone calls are made in advance and just make sure that you guys have a plan and that you're communicating to it, to everyone so that everyone is on the same page with how you're going to handle the needs of your patients and your staff. One other area to discuss is um, your cleaning schedule, um, your visitation implications. If you're able to do any visitation via um, not face-to-face, -face, that would be important. Um, your staffing implications, can you screen your staff when they're coming in? That would be great. How are you going to handle your staff that are ill? Any type of external visits, can you complete telehealth for those particular patients so that they don't have to go out if they have specialty appointments? That would be extremely beneficial as well at this time, so you're not sending patients in and out of the hospital, the containment portion is the most important during this time. So while you're assessing patients, obviously we know that standard precautions are most important. Eye protection, gowns, gloves, um, the mask is what we need. Private rooms with the door closed is, if you're able to do that, would be most beneficial. But while you're collecting your assessment information, the respiratory symptoms are vital because we want to be able to depict from flu-type symptoms, from the lower respiratory symptoms and pneumonia-type symptoms. 
Vital signs should be collected if possible. Most people are able to do that. If you have that type of equipment available, that is extremely important. There are some places that have um, officers that are collecting intake information, and they may not be able to collect objective data immediately, so subjective information may be necessary. Um, make sure that you're collecting things like when did this start, any travel that has been completed by the patient or any close contact of that person, and any description of any external healthcare partners or places that they have been most recently is imperative to obtain. If you've tested a patient while their results are pending, ensure that the patient is placed in isolation. Any close contacts to that person should be screened, and if necessary, those patients should also be placed in isolation. If a patient is placed or admitted to the hospital, um, negative pressure rooms are most often necessary, but many places don't have that available. Um, so isolation would be the next best alternative to that if it's, if isolation or if negative pressure rooms are not available. Some of the smaller hospitals and rural communities don't necessarily have those types of rooms. So know what your hospitals and your local communities have available for you and ensure that you have a plan with that community partner. Let's say you have a case of COVID-19. How are you going to handle the case after you have the intake of that person? So we know that we need to isolate this particular patient. We need to assess any close contacts within your setting. You may need to think about containment in that particular pod or area of your facility. So again, we talked about telehealth a little earlier on. If you need to do that to contain your facility, that's a reasonable option. Um, identify and mitigate any gaps in readiness, and that could include other areas. If, if you're a jail, you may need to work through areas for um, court hearings, is there a feasible option to, uh, to allow someone to have a court date via or a court time via um, Skyping, if that's possible. And also another area to think about, especially with jails with a rapid turnover, if you have a sick pot or sick people in that area, discharge planning is also important. We don't want to turn these folks out into the community without having some sort of a plan. That doesn't mean to rush everyone or to send them to your local emergency room or hospital. Um, they only need to go to the hospital if they are hospital level of care. But we need to have a plan for discharge for these folks. And as we know, many of our clients, um, especially in some of the rural jails, um, are homeless. So, we really don't want to send these folks out that could potentially infect other people. Just kind of think those things through, what kind of plan you may need for, for those type of folks. And what's that? Thank yeah. you, Shelley. Next, we'll hear from uh, Major thank Barrett. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, as way of background, um, our detention facility is a 13-story direct supervision high-rise um, located immediately next to Washington, D.C. and Fairfax County, Virginia. Uh, we have a physical capacity for 719 inmates and normally operate with a population around uh, 500. However, of late, our population has dropped to 280. Um, our surrounding uh, jurisdictions uh, D.C. and Fairfax have um, confirmed cases presently, and as of yesterday, our county just our county just confirmed a case uh, yesterday as well. Uh, so this is a very real event for us right here in Arlington County. 
in regards to preventative protocols for jails, uh, it really starts first and foremost for us with a partnership with our local police department and fire department, educating them on the signs and symptoms of what we just listened to here. And we're doing that in coordination with our health department so that we're staying current with CDC and what is going on out there around us. Uh, we're providing our police department uh, with our booking and medical screen forms so that they can kind of do a what we call a triage check on an arrestee or an individual in the field itself before they even come to our facility. Uh, this enables them, uh, if it's appropriate, to either possibly issue a summons, they don't even come to our facility, uh, and or if it's appropriate to uh, take them directly to the hospital as well uh, in communication with them with our local hospital. Uh, if they are coming to our facility, we've asked um, our law, our uh, police department uh, to contact us ahead of time, uh, if possible, so that our staff can be uh, properly uh, prepared. Now, once a, a person uh, is brought to our booking area, regardless of how they come in, we're checking all individuals for fever with uh, no touch, an infrared no touch thermometer uh, presently. Now, while these protocols keep changing, and you can see, we're, we're, as I'm listening about the fever and coughs, uh, if an arrestee or inmate temperature is 101 for us, um, and they have that cold and cough uh, symptoms going on, we're going to issue them an N95 respirator. We happen to have about 12,000 on stock just from our previous uh, preparations from other pandemics as well. Now, once the inmate puts that on their face, they're going to wash their hands, and then we're going to go through and conduct our uh, booking processing procedures that we need to have at the same and then place them in a, in a separate cell kind of quarantine off our medical units being contacted um, and our nurse is going to go over the questionnaire with the new uh, individual the new inmate uh, going over our protocol checklist uh, if they appear to be infected then our nurse is going to reach out directly to our contracted doctor um, and we'll be listening to what he says and he's basically reaching out to our public health department, so we're coordinating in our approach to that. Now, here's the kicker: if um, here's the kicker is if if the inmate refuses to wear the mask, and we can get combative as well, is for them to um, our staff to put on masks uh, themselves for their protection uh, at that time. Continue to to uh, quarantine the individual and handle them as we would normally handle someone who may not be cooperative with the booking process. Uh, our public health department has advised us, uh, you know, that the treatment for COVID-19 is a supportive, is more of a supportive care, fever management, and symptom abatement medication. Uh, those who develop the pneumonia are hospitalized and will be treated appropriately. Um, at our detention facility, we will be doing chest X-rays and blood tests as part of the assessment if needed. However, housing in our facility versus, for example, hospitalization will be determined by the severity of the illness and by our uh, Department of Health in particular. Uh, once an inmate, however, has been removed from our holding cells, we're going to be cleaning the holding cell with an electrostatic sprayer as well immediately and as well with a uh, sanitizer wipes in addition to that uh, as well. Now, once you get into our housing unit, uh, you know, we have instructed already in educating our inmates of washing their hands uh, once they enter into our housing unit. Um, we have sinks within the common areas, and so those are being utilized quite a bit now. Uh, and we're in the process of educating our, uh, the inmate population on COVID-19 with our medical staff and as well as our inmate services staff to uh, alleviate their concerns uh, in addition. Uh, we are also ensuring our housing units are being cleaned daily as well, significantly. Uh, and because we're a high-rise type facility, elevators and our elevator buttons and doorknobs are also being cleaned as well in addition to that. Uh, we happen to have an electrostatic sprayer and we're using that, focusing it primarily in our high traffic areas and critical areas, such as our booking and processing areas, uh, visiting, medical, intake, uh, housing units, and we're doing that daily, uh, if not more, twice a day, depending on what we have, uh, basically continuously cleaning. And we've also ordered a secondary one as well to keep up with the volume of those sort of things as well. Uh, very early on, we 
I started sending out messaging to our volunteers and the staff uh, asking that if they had traveled to some of those countries identified by the CDC to, to stay home for the 14 days as this is all evolving as well. Um, we are presently looking at reassessing our programming and seeing if it's appropriate at this point to stop uh, having some of the volunteers come in uh, to help mitigate uh, the spread of this within the, the community. Uh, and we're looking to basically, if we can strip pretty much all the programs down to maybe possibly just having uh, religious uh, facilitators on site. Um, so we're really looking at containing this, uh, who's having access within the facility. And this includes our attorneys as well. Most of our attorneys are used to having contact visits, and we are discussing stopping that presently right now as well uh, for everybody's health and safety. Uh, staff, we are talking to staff uh, constantly about uh, if they are sick to stay home. Uh, we have issued hand sanitizer and sanitizing wipes uh, at their workstations for employee use and also to uh, clean their workstations in, in particular as well uh, constantly. And our medical staff and et cetera, we're also uh, addressing uh, formal programming with them as well. Uh, now, should we have an active case, we do have two negative pressure cells to utilize, but we only have two. So if we start to get more cases, uh, we are looking at, we actually have an empty housing unit at this present time, uh, using that as a containment area as well uh, to manage that sort of outbreak if and should it occur. Um, we're also looking um, to turn it possibly into a, a discussion with our public health department about um, uh, discharge planning as well uh, with our health department. Uh, basically what we have done at this point is to uh, um, update our pandemic flu response uh, with uh, uh, the COVID-19 particulars as CDC and as the World Health Organization as our public health departments updated as well. So as this keeps changing and modifying, and one thing we can do is be prepared. And as our previous speaker said, planning is really important. We're discussing walkthroughs with our staff in terms of what I call in the law enforcement community, what ifs, what if this occurs, how are we addressing it, how are we handling it, and educating our staff to be the best prepared we can be uh, for our staff, for those charged for our custody, and for our community as a whole as well. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what we're doing. I want to uh, thank everyone for letting us participate on this uh, very, very important issue. Uh, and I'll turn this over to my next colleague, Mike, uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. We appreciate your time and uh, energies into this as well. Next, uh, Ms. Rez Resnick is on board. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as the major said, um, you know, he gave a little bit of background and introduction, just to give you a little bit of background and introduction of uh, the Baltimore City facility uh, that I oversee. We are in an urban area. We are in downtown Baltimore, a city of 650,000 people. Uh, while cases have been identified in the state of Maryland, they haven't been in the city. Um, we have a population of about uh, 2,250 individuals in five facilities. As I said, they're downtown Baltimore in an urban area. Um, and what I'm going to go through is uh, what we have done uh, to prepare, and a lot of this might be repetitive. Um, we have been in communication and coordinate with our public health officials. We have a um, uh, director of clinical services in our department, and she works with the state health department and they provide us with the most up-to-date guidance from um, CDC and we implement that guidance in our operations. Um, we have began by looking at our emergency management plans and our COOP, our continuation of operation plans, ensuring all of our facility managers are familiar with those plans. Uh, we've conducted tabletop drills and specifically the uh, pandemic and emergency staffing um, situations. Um, to ensure that everyone is on the same page and that we, we, we're all familiar with those, um, with those plans. Um, we've identified sufficient quarantine locations. Now, um, in, in our setting, that's a little bit difficult because space is, uh, space is limited and we don't have the luxury of having um, vacant housing areas. So we, we have to look at moving the general population around to free up some areas. But all of our jails have identified uh, space that we will use as quarantine locations, um, specifically uh, for 
um, the emergency staffing situations. If we run into emergencies and we have to have staff stay over and they have to work 12-hour shifts um, or they're here for longer periods of time, um, because depending on what goes on out in the community, we've identified respite locations for our staff, so where they can sleep, where they can shower, where they can eat. Um, and, and stay over in the facility. Um, we've also um, ensured that we're having an adequate supply of uh, personal protection equipment for staff and inmates who will need it. Um, we're also stocking in supplies of uh, food and essential supplies, cleaning supplies, um, soap, hand sanitizer, so that all facilities have um, adequate supply of that. We're also increasing our sanitation on every shift. This occurs several times, so we're, we're wiping down common areas, shared areas, tables, telephones, um, doors, keys, elevator panels, uh, that sort of thing. Um, we're communicating. I think this is very important to let the inmates and staff know um, what the plans are. Um, we're getting the information out via roll call, informational bulletins, nurse educators on the housing units to talk to the inmate population um, regarding infection control, sanitation, personal hygiene, inmates who exhibit symptoms um, or don't feel well, we're encouraging them to you know, put in sick call slips, tell staff, see medical uh, officers or staff who um, exhibit symptoms or don't feel well or sick to stay home, they're encouraged to get medical care. Uh, we are curtailing our volunteer activities and we're assessing which activities are, are vital and important that we should continue and those um, that aren't as important or aren't as necessary, um, we'll, we'll be canceling those. We're also taking a look at our um, social, our social visits are non-contact visits, but our attorney visits are all contact visits, obviously, so we're taking a look at where we can have non-contact um, attorney visits when that becomes necessary. Um, so these are the the, um, the the measures that we're taking to prepare. And again, as I said, um, it, it seems redundant because we're basing what we're doing off of the guidance we're getting from our communications with public health officials. So I will turn it over to the next panelist. Uh, in our discussion, Direct Director Chamber Smith uh, is our next uh, speaker. Thank you, Director. Director Chamber Smith, um, are you on board? Director Chamber Smith, um, could you, could you um, please make sure that your line is unmuted? They can't hear. Yeah, she can't hear us. One moment, folks, while we uh, try to correct this. One moment, folks, while we get um, Director Chamber Smith on the phone.
and is working with the Department of Health. We do not want non-clinicians freelancing and making stuff up as they go along and going their own way. So we have her in all of our exercises, and she is in control of a lot of our planning. Um, of course, we did general preparedness, and I'm not going to go over the hand washing and social distancing and things because I think people have covered that adequately. But um, it can't be overstated the importance because there was a study done with a school where they just stopped in place and washed their hands twice a day, and they were able to cut the regular flu infection in half. So we know this works. We talk about it all the time. We do have some secret shopper stuff going on to make sure that our healthcare staff are washing their hands correctly because I think that's a place where complacency can build up. So we're using our quality improvement coordinators to just kind of watch people washing their hands casually to make sure we're really doing it for long enough, we're really being thorough. Um, I think controlling the message is important, and so we're telling people what to expect at different levels. Um, we don't want people to be surprised. We want them to know when I say we're in orange level, this is what that means. And so we spent some time writing that into policy and, and educating people about it. Um, I also am emphasizing that clinical guidance is fluid, it's dynamic, it's changing all the time. And because of that, don't go back and look at three-week-old information for direction and also don't get frustrated. We've had two conference calls today, just for example, the first one, let everybody know, hey, we're in green level and this is what we're doing. And the second one, which I did while we were off this call, actually, is to say we had moved to our orange level. So our orange level, uh, which we, we have triggers that cause it. So the orange level gets triggered when we have a community-acquired case. And so before, in the national news yesterday, you heard Ohio had three cases, but none of them were acquired in Ohio. Now our health department consulted with me literally while we were on this call and said, okay, we believe we have community-acquired cases. We don't have a, a test back yet, but we're sure enough that you need to go ahead and move to Orange. So Orange for us, which, you know, our staff does know this and we're uh, communicating to our inmates and family members as well, is that visiting will close. So Ohio's visiting is closed as of now. Volunteers are not permitted in. Uh, no non-essential contractors are permitted in, and wardens make this decision. They decide what's essential for their facility and what's not. Screening at front entry for staff and contractors and lawyer visits. Um, pulling our outside and make work crews and not permitting them to go out anymore. Um, changing our reception practices. Increasing video visitation. Uh, working get, to get some free phone calls for people so that we can have more videos and more phone calls to have more communication with family while we are not visiting. And a hold on all of the non-essential travel, which only the director can decide that travel is uh, mission critical and essential. No travel outside the state. So that's orange for us. Um, now, that's where we're at now. We're implementing that. We uh, talk. Now, the red level for us is... Um, you know, this is a, at a point where operations can't continue as normal. So clearly we're in orange, but we don't have to be sick right now, so we can continue as normal. But if we got to a point where we had cases inside of our prison, where, you know, certain other triggers happen with the progression of disease, we would get to the point of stopping all but life-threatening medical trips, um, no transfers unless there's an emergency, tighter inmate movement, quarantining, dining in cells, down to essential staffing, working from home for those who can do that. So there's a lot more that has happened with RED, and it's a very much institution-specific because every institution has different physical plants, different access to negative pressure cells, et cetera. So each individual prison in Ohio has to write their own plan that's based upon the overarching plans that we have. And so that leads them to have their own quarantining plans. Um, I think it's very important to communicate to stakeholders before you get to the next level what to expect. Uh, we, we communicated to our, our inmate population already that we were closed down visiting if we got to this point. So they've had a chance to have the shock and awe, and now that we're doing it, I think it's not maybe going to be as shocking as it would have been if we hadn't informed them ahead. We do use an incident command system. 
and some of the task force we put in place are things like a commodity task force. So, for example, we've already procured additional food. If there's an interruption in the commodities chain, we want to make sure that we have enough food for three weeks. We don't normally store that much. Um, there's just different things like that. And then there's other agencies that couldn't procure the food. So we work with our sister cabinet agencies to take care of them as well. So I, I do think that's important as well to try to take care of other cabinet agencies too when you can. But PPE is a problem. And because it's a problem for us, we uh, have been following the Department of Health guidelines and using it basically with medical staff. That's the long and the short of it. And we do not have enough to give to every officer. We, we know that once it gets wet and once you're touching it and things like that, we have people with beards. I mean, it's not always effective under these circumstances. So since we do not have enough for everybody all the time, we're concentrating on medical staff and if we would have a, a suspected case with, a, with an inmate. Um, of course, the, our entry, we're what we plan on not only doing a questionnaire as recommended by the CDC, but we're also planning on taking a temperature. And that's part of orange level. Um, so those are the kind of things that we work on with, with regard to, you know, chemical control and things like that. Uh, we've been controlling information flow, but we do want to make sure that everybody's able to ask questions. So every day there's a phone call between myself, the regional directors, and the warden and the adult parole authority of regionals. And, and that allows those leaders that are running operations to bring up whatever new rumors there are, to ask us whatever questions or guidance, and for us to reiterate what's going on in the state that day, what's come from the health department, what's come from the governor. And I just really want to make it so that when staff are concerned about something, it gets right up to us daily. Um, the medical staff have regular calls. The health care administrators in the facilities do the same thing. And then also labor. So we've been working with our unions, because not, not every state has unions, but we have unions, and we need them to be our partners. We need them to be informed. Can't leave them out under. Um, I would also mention that, you know, I just said we have a shortage of certain PPE, but there's been theft in Ohio in different areas when it comes to this type of stuff. So I think that locking up your PPE and, and accounting for it is very important, or else you'll find you don't have any. I also think now um, really setting up a phone line for the family is our next step so that they have a phone line at the central office to call into and ask questions because if they really don't, uh, they're going to make stuff up or they're going to flood our prison. So that's the next thing we're setting up and that should be up and running today. We are encouraging our sick employees to stay home and um, we are being as flexible as possible. In our state, we're being very generous about giving leave and that kind of stuff. Uh, in, in reference to our incarcerated adults, we have advised all of them what the symptoms of the disease are and told them they don't have to pay a copay. So for those of you who have a copay, that's another policy we changed. No copay during the life of this influenza when you are uh, approaching medical about flu-related symptoms because we don't want that to be a barrier to them self-reporting. Now, separating sick employees, um, you know, separating is brief for us because our plan would be if you had the dry cough and the fever and things like that, we would send you home. But if you have to wait for a ride or if there's some time period that has to go by before you can actually leave, you would quarantine the employee away from other people so that they could not breathe on folks. Everyone's been advised, cover your mouth, wash your hands, coughing etiquette. I made a video for the staff and literally demonstrated it as did our health department director. So <laughs> those are the kind of things that we are we're trying to put in place. Um, so I guess don't panic. Uh, review your policies and procedures. And if you have policies and procedures, don't assume A, that people know what they are, or B, that they're exactly correct for this time be willing to look at those and make changes. And some people may, may require training to even do what's being requested in the policy. For example, we decided we're going to use our entrance people to, to scan their fellow staff members, but they need to be trained on what to look for and how to use the thermometer properly, um, things like that. And then, of course, we do follow directions from the CDC and the WHO 
we do report to the local health department and our state health department. So for the most part, our state health department is in lockstep with the CDC, who's in lockstep with the WHO, so you know, we're allowed, we're able to use our health department friendly. We are also responding to all reporting requirements, which I think has been a problem in some places. So if you're a director, you might want to make sure you're living up to your reporting um, standards. Um, I think that might be about it. Thank you, Director Chamber Smith. Dr. Deal, some closing comments? Yeah, th th thank you, Jerry. I think we heard, uh, just kind of recap the today's events. We heard lots of information uh, this morning, this afternoon, and certainly the director talked about some of the key features. And one of the big ones we want to make sure uh, not to panic. As she suggested, that we try to, try to stay calm. We have provided lots of information to you. We talked about the epidemiology portion of it, clinical features. We would propose a model system for correctional uh, system to monitor, you know, especially trying to isolate, you know, case of specific cases, monitor, do surveillance procedures. And of course, the biggest key for us to is remember, educate staff and communication is important. I think the more you do it, the better of you are. People understand what the policies and procedures are there. And this is probably a good time to review your procedures uh, to make sure people do understand uh, what, what needs to be done. And of course, planning is important. Proactive is really good because, especially for staffing analysis, when you start talking about, you know, telling staff to stay home, you got to have a contingency plan to say how you're going to uh, staff your facilities at that point. And again, as a last point, what I want to make sure is that uh, prevention procedures are in place for because that's going to be the key. And washing, like we mentioned mul multiple times, and also trying to align with your uh, public health authorities outside and make sure you follow your recommendations not only for local hospitals, local public health, but also the national and international guidelines the CDC and W Health Organization will continue to put down. And really, I think you got lots of information today to set up the plan in motion and start the prevention. So I'll turn over to Victoria for any possible questions and intercessions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Deal. So we have some questions that have come in already, uh, but now is the time for you to type in your questions in the designated Q&A box for the panelists. Um, I will remind the panelists that we have unmuted all of you, and as I go through some of the questions that have come through, I will go ahead and either ask one directly to one of the panelists, but please remember that any of the panelists can chime in if you have information that will answer the question. But because we are running pretty close and the webinar will wrap up at 4, I want to remind everyone who's on the webinar that if we don't get to your question, please go ahead and send it to us anyway because we are keeping track of all the questions that come through. And more than likely, we are posting resources from different states or from the CDC or the WHO to address your question and we will get to it and we will post a resource to help answer your question. So on our ACA online resource, we are going to have a Corona COVID-19 page on the ACA website. So one of the questions that came through was, besides the affected person and attending medical staff, should anyone else wear a mask? So this is a good one um, from the infection control perspective. So Shelly, do you think you can speak more on that? Yes. So at this time, that has not been recommended. Only an infected person that is currently coughing and healthcare folks are recommended to wear a mask. The healthcare folks that are directly treating infected persons. This is Dr. Deal. If I may just add something to what Shelley said, I think it's important when you're directly involved with the caring of the patient, those are people who should be wearing the mask, but not anybody yeah. around it. Thanks. Okay. Um, another question. Um, do you really think simply screening employees for fever, cough, um, and dyspnea will suffice? And should intakes and transfers not be quarantined on intake? Uh, Dr. Deal? I can take that question, yes. Uh, I think as we showed the clinical features uh, we talked about 
you know, myself and the infectious disease doc talked about the, the symptoms that are prevalent. We also want to make sure that we do want to screen people for cough and fever because I don't think we want to confuse people thinking about that I have a head cold or congestion. And other other clinical component to keep in mind is that we talked about the epidemiology portion of it to having symptoms can vary. And the first case that was presented from uh, uh, Texas, the first case in the U.S. had predominantly was cough, and then had also had a fever going to about 101. I think those are people we need to screen for. So if we do think about screening in that process, uh, also would, I would still continue to ask anybody the fatigue and nausea and, and diarrhea portion of it too, because there's some people might uh, have some different questions about that. So if you making the decision process for screening and having people coming back, make sure people are febrile at least 24 to 48 hours before they come back. And I think what I would recommend for the county jails or the reception centers, trying to get kind of two-way communications with them to make sure they have not been exposed to somebody else in their county jail. And then if, you, if there is some suspicion, and also to survey your, com uh, your, your community as well, because some of, those, some of the cases might be suspected, suspected cases in the community, and you might have some people coming up parole revocation coming to the system, so you might not have any sense of that. So I think you need to kind of have a multi-tier system approach to make sure you try to screen some people, even though the first couple of days you might not have any symptoms, but the fever is going to be the first one that you're going to be addressing the issues. So even if they might not have cough at that time or has a dry cough, you still, you know, you should still be red flags going up to say, maybe I should take a precaution uh, until the testing is done appropriately and try to at least isolate for that point of view. And that's the approach that we're going to take too. Because we get, you know, from 93 county jails, people come all the time, and we started the communication with the county jails right now to say, hey, if you have a suspected case in your case, can you hold them for a little bit, or maybe we can come up with a mutual agreement of isolating the person. So it is going to be complicated in a sense to how to do it, but I think this multi-tiered approach should be taken, and I hope hope that answers your question. Okay, another question that came through: How do you know when a person is no longer infectious? So um, maybe Shelley or Dr. Deal? And I can take that too, and Shelley can chime in too. I think what we want to make sure, what we have been telling people for any kind of viral infections, that they come back to, they have to be febrile without fever for at least 24 to 48 hours. Uh, because I know that's kind of the first clinical symptom that goes up, and then it's also the last one to go down, that we know the person is probably not con uh, contagious at that stage. But you know, as we presented the data today, anywhere from two to 14 days is kind of the cutoff. So the 14 days after for somebody who has been quarantined or self-isolation and no fever, we, you, your beds are pretty safe at that point. Michelle, do you have to add anything else? To that? No, I agree with you. That's what the current literature indicates. OK, um, and now we have one um, dealing more with the custody side. How do the custody staff deal with the quarantine dorms or the quarantine housing? Um, maybe Mr. Resnick can chime in? Sure. In terms of dealing with it, um, you know, we, like I said, we we have all of our facilities identify areas uh, where we will have quarantine uh, inmates who are um, sick or exhibiting symptoms, um, and we will ensure that the staff who are working in those areas have the necessary protective gear or trained how to use it, how to take it off. Um, you know, medical staff will be there to treat and care for individuals. If they have to go out to the hospital, we'll make sure transport officers have the necessary equipment. Um, and as somebody brought up uh, earlier in the in the webinar. We have um, communications with the hospitals to ensure that, you know, they know who we're bringing and when we're bringing, and we have that open line of communication. But it's just identifying those areas where we're going to be quarantining people. Um, only the people who meet the criteria will be housed there, and the officers will be specially trained and specially equipped to be in those areas. Okay. I'll repeat the question. Oh, sorry. I'm fine. Yeah, no, this is continue. Sure. I said I'd agree with my colleague there on that. I think the critical element of this is educating uh, the staff and making sure that uh, we do have and using the proper personal protection gear as well. But education, education is the rule on this right now just to alleviate people's concerns as well. Uh, we're all professionals and we know what we're dealing with here to some extent and, and not to overreact, but to make, remain calm and, and, and treat this appropriately. 
Okay. Um, I wanted to repeat the question uh, for Director Chambers-Smith. Um, how can the custody staff deal with a quarantine dorm? Um, we, we have different protocols in place. Now, we don't have PPE in the regular dorms. If we get to the point of quarantining, we would extend it to the staff that are dealing with the quarantine. But the most important thing is boredom, right? So staying at least two meters away would be one thing. And the other thing would be, you know, they're worried. We might need to set up mental health phone calls with them when they get quarantined because they're panicking in there. And the staff have to know, like, stay 15, you know, good 15 feet away, alert mental health staff when you need to. We might arrange a phone call between the family member. It's about keeping people calm, and, and they're still people, and they're still patients. So the other part that I think is important is when you get outside your quarantine period, um, not having people, um, you know, treating them differently and staff treating them differently and, you know, reintroducing them when it's appropriate and taking care of whatever the health care problem they actually had that got them in there. And the staff has to be informed every step of the way. So we have, of course, we have HIPAA, but our, our custody staff that are involved directly are people that we have trained not to provide HIPAA information, and so they too would get information that they wouldn't normally get so that they can interact appropriately in the situation. And it's all about training and distancing and, you know, those kinds of things and making sure that the doctors are talking not just to the nurses, but we have to involve the officers that are being used to watch these folks because they, that settles our panic. And there are definitely things they can do to be safer. Um, we designate this bathroom is to be used for the people that are in quarantine. No one else is using this bathroom, like physical plant things like that that people overlook sometimes. But those little things are the things that keep people safer and that keep people calmer. Okay, thank you. Um, we Victoria, have time for one last Victoria, question. Victoria, yeah. this is Dr. Leo, can I just add some more? And I think the director's point sure. is really valid. That trying to use a multidisciplinary team approach because we want to protect the, the staff as well as the patients. So sharing some of the illnesses information but not to a detail would be very helpful for both the staff and the medical staff as well because being you know, a part of the custody staff is going to be taking care of them most of the time so we really need to protect them as well so i'm glad you brought up the HIPAA issue the director okay thank you um so just this last question uh in the context of the information that was presented what if anything changes um for juvenile settings or detention settings? Dr. Deal? So I think we'll still continue to use the same approach as we talked about uh, multiple times, just going back to universal precautions. Uh, juvenile system is a little bit diff uh, different compared to that, but we, I think it's just so long we enforce hand washing, precautions to take, distancing process. Uh, we'll continue the same, you know, same way. And of course, the, if you look at the data that we showed, uh, you know, the younger juveniles are not as prone to uh, higher infection as we have seen uh, from the slides that we presented. So I think just kind of basic common sense using hand washing precautions, this thing, education process, and symptomatic treatment, they t tend to be much more healthier and resilient to to get over some of the illnesses. So. I think that's be a lot better compared to the other spectrum of the population that we deal with. Okay, thank you. And that's it for the questions. But like I said, we are keeping track of them, and we will be updating the ACA website as needed. Um, so we will move on. Here are some resources that can help guide your agency. Much of this information can also be found on the ACA Correctional Healthcare Resource Center under the Healthcare drop-down menu on the ACA website. Thank you to all of our presenters. In closing, a screen will pop up immediately after this event ends for all of our registered attendees. There is an evaluation you need to complete if you purchase continuing education units for a certificate of attendance. If you need, if you have questions or need assistance, please reach out to ACA's Office of Correctional Health. ACA is able to provide continuing education units for nurses, physicians, and mid-levels, and other corrections professionals like security, administrators, program staff, and others who have attended this live broadcast. 
Once again, we want to give a special thanks to all of our presenters. This webinar, along with the presentation and links to all resources, will be made available on the ACA website at www.aca.org under the Correctional Health Resource Center drop-down menu next week. In closing, on behalf of the American Correctional Association, thank you all for what you do for the field of corrections, public safety, and public health. This concludes the special session broadcast.